Okay. So, got a few people chiming in here. Yay. Well, should we get started as people come yeah, up? Yeah, let's get started for sure. Here, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Thanks everyone for tuning in to another edition of the Slay at Home speaker series. We're here to tell you a little bit about some gear storage and maintenance tips. Um, you know, snow's melting, season's kind of coming to an end and uh, ready to keep our gear nice and healthy and stored for the summer and ready for next, next season. I'm Ellen. Hi, everyone. Ellen with the Weston crew. Just a little reminder here, we've got an Aerie fundraiser still going on. If you head over to the Weston uh, Backcountry homepage, Hatchet Split is still available. 100% um, of those proceeds are going to Avalanche Education and Research, so check it out. Speaking of, got some of the finest Avalanche Education educators in the house here. What's up, guys? Hi. Um, cool. Well, I'm Emily Hargraves and I run Backcountry Babes. Uh, we're an avalanche education course provider, like Ellen just mentioned. And so we teach area avalanche level one courses, uh, rescue courses, level two, and we do also beginner backcountry tours to learn how to use your equipment for the first time, uh, intermediate tours, and then we do week long trips to Japan or Iceland, British Columbia is one of our most popular trips. So we kind of have a range of different things that we do. Um, and yeah, so as this, um, as our season kind of was wrapping up here, I thought it might be fun to write a little blog about what to do with your gear and how to prep it in the spring to store it for the summer. So normally I do a bunch of like gear maintenance in the spring to, um, so that I can just have the freshest stuff for the last month of skiing. So maybe in March, I'll do a tune-up and a base grind, a bunch of stuff we're going to talk about in this presentation. So that not only am I having awesome equipment for the spring, but by the time I go to store it in the summer, I'm storing it in good shape because inevitably I'm going to forget about it and pull it out um, in December and it'll be like good to go because I did this prep work. So we thought it might be a good time Maybe some people have extra time on their hands these days. Um, maybe not, depending on your situation, but we thought we'd share some of our tips and answer some questions. Um, so if you're just tuning in, I'm Emily Hargraves and I run Backcountry Babes. And then we also have Ellen here who just introduced herself and Sarah, you wanna introduce oh. yourself? <laughs> Thanks Emily, um, my name is Sarah McGregor. I am Tuning in from, I'm actually in Steamboat, Colorado, helping some family out with some things, uh, but I live in Gunnison, Colorado, mm -hmm. and I'm a slipboard guide, uh, an avalanche educator, and a full-time rock climbing guide in the summers. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to just sharing some tips with you guys, uh, basically just getting everything shred ready so that there are no surprises when we pull out all of our gear next season and forget about everything that we were supposed to do by way of maintenance, repairs, and replacements. Awesome. Awesome, guys. Without further ado, this is kind of what's on the agenda for tonight. We're going to run through the important stuff, the ski and split board maintenance, boots, skins, beacons, outerwear, first aid, restock, and then open it up for some questions. So skis and splits. Also, shout out to our good friends at Pearl Wax. Awesome wax. Go for it for the storage, guys. Eco-friendly. Good stuff. All right, Emily, if you want to go in. All right, so um, getting a tune-up for your skis is awesome. You can definitely DIY. There's lots of videos about how to do it. Um, and if you live in a mountain town or a city with a good ski shop, I just love to take my skis to the ski shop because they do it regularly. They have the right tools and the right setup. And so that's, that's what I do. I take them to a shop and get my skis tuned up, which usually means straighten out the edges, sharpen the edges, wax. Um, and sometimes you'll see number two here, base grind, which, um, you know, I didn't know what that was till a couple years ago, but basically you have bottom your bases here and just run it through a machine that shaves off a layer and adds new texture. So if you look really closely at the bottom of your skis, you'll see like 
um, channels or grooves or diamonds or there's all different textures in the bases of your skis. And if you, if you're, you know, as you ski, you kind of wear that texture down or get little nicks and grooves. In the spring, you'll actually like more, even more important than wax is having these channels and grooves to get the water out from under your skis so you glide better. Um, so it's a really cool thing and it basically it's maybe like 50 to 90 bucks. It's a big piece of machinery and they just run them through. Um, so at a shop that has the machinery, it'll just give you a base grind and then it makes a nice smooth surface to put wax on. And um, cross country skiers apparently are super knowledgeable about the texture on the bottom of skis. It's been a thing cross country racers for a long time, but um, it's awesome for backcountry. Um, snowboards, split boards at the resort, but all, all of the above. Um, and it doesn't really take like a lot off the bottom of your skis at all. So um, if it's something you haven't checked out before, I recommend it. And um, if you have DPS uh, phantom wax, the permanent wax, it sinks into the bases. And so if you get a base grind, does that remove the phantom? Uh, it doesn't, no, because the phantom like trickles down all the way through the bases. So when you base grind, you take off a layer, but because the phantom's already permeated throughout when you applied it, it just gives it a refresh. So that's kind of a cool thing um, if you have the permanent wax and then you can wax on top of that with different temperatures if you want to or not. Um, so in the spring, I obviously like to put on a spring wax, which means warmer temperatures. So like you can, you can almost see the water droplets in the snow, it slows you down. So if you have the spring wax, it helps you glide, which is nice. Um, and when you're done for the season, you can put on a thick layer of the yellow wax and don't scrape it off and just leave it on there for summer storage. And um, people like to do that to keep just keep your faces from drying out and also um, when you scrape it off next season you can ski right on it and you'll be ready to go. Um, keep your skis in a cool dry place so you don't um, you know get uh, rust on your edges and stuff like that. Um, yeah and so yellow wax is just like the color of the wax and usually the colors are related to temperature. You can check out pearl yellow wax or you can ask at you know any um, ski shop, like what they recommend their storage wax, because different brands might have different recommendations, but um, a lot of times it's the yellow one is like spring and storage. Um, do y'all have anything to add to the tune-up tips? Definitely, definitely. I just want to go in there on for all of you guys who are a little bit harder on your gear. Fix those core shots before you add that storage wax. This would be a lot harder to repair those core shots if you have wax in them over the summer. So kind of a quick step-by-step, -step, scrape off your excess wax or climbing glue, use a base cleaner, acetone, paint thinner, work as a substitute as well. Put your uh, epoxy or PTEX in there. This is also DIY stuff. I would suggest taking it to your local shop. They go, those guys are experts, but if you wanna do it on your own, a couple quick tips. After it's dry, smooth it out with a metal scraper, bastard file, or sanding paper, and then put your prep wax on it. Like I said, it's going to be a lot harder to repair those core shots um, if you have wax in them over the summer, so take care of those beforehand. Pro tip. Nice. Um, and I'll just like chime in like for everybody listening. Feel free to like leave comments as we go. Um, if you have any thoughts or disagreements or like tips that we didn't cover at the end, um, as well as any questions, keep them coming. And if we can't get to all your questions, we'll definitely at least respond to them afterward. Definitely, definitely. Cool. cool. Moving on a little bit of edge, edge maintenance. Don't let those rusty edges fester over the summer. You can use an edge tuner to clean them up. Also take them to your shop couple little bit of measurements if you do want to go for it. Uh, most skis use a two degree side bevel, five degree or one degree base bevel. Snowboards are usually a two degree side bevel and 0.5 degree base bevel. And I'm also guys, we're going to be putting all this into a master blog that we'll be sharing out next week too. So we'll have all this info in a little bit more depth that we're going to be able to share, share more. 
So Odwin, um, it depends on what time of the winter you're gonna get out. So Odwin asked, um, because you're using warm wax text, uh, temp wax, do you have to replace it with a different wax at the beginning of the season? If it's still warm at the beginning of the season when you start writing again, um, you should be able to still just keep the, the warm wax on there. Um, and some people actually choose to not even scrape the wax just so that they're maybe a little bit more protected for, um, because there's a lot more rocks, you know, in early season writing. So, um, and then bad things about base cleaner from tuning videos. Has anyone heard bad things about base cleaner? Ooh. Hmm. I, I haven't heard anything bad about base cleaner. I haven't either. I mean, I guess don't go overboard. <laughs> but also, I'm not an expert on this. So like, talk to your shop. <laughs> talk to your local guru at your shop if you have any deeper questions. Definitely, definitely. And we'll have some time to answer some questions too. I cannot see the questions. So thanks guys for, <laughs> for answering those. All right, we're going to move on to bindings. Um, just a little tip for snowboard bindings. If you have them tight, it's going to uh, pull all of the base material upwards. So not a bad idea to remove the bindings and let the materials relax. Ski bindings. Here's something I've heard. Um, I've heard I've heard that some people like to, uh, yeah, reduce their their din, like like you have posted here. But I've heard that some people also like to lubricate their pin bindings with some WD-40 and then like press it in and out to get it worked in, so that the pin bindings don't get like the spring doesn't get as gummed up. Um, definitely, I'm not as much of a skier, so uh, I don't have as much experience with that one. But would love to hear what people's thoughts are on that. Um, I also think that it's a good idea that now's a good time to, to add blue Loctite to your screws. Um, I've definitely had problems in the past with, with my splitboard screws coming out while I'm touring. So it's always a good idea to make sure every little screw has some more Loctite on it. Um, so when you've removed all of those screws, put them all together in a bag after you've dried the Loctite on them. And that way they're ready to go and you don't have to go searching for everything before you put your bindings back together. Mm -hmm. Underline, underline if you lose things. <laughs> Highly recommend that tip. Keep all your stuff together. <laughs> yeah, now's a good time to re like make any repairs. Like if, you, if there's like something that's kind of loose that you're like not too sure about, like just repair it, replace it. And if you have to order any new parts or new screws, order a couple extra to add to your repair kit just so that you have those ready to go. Um, if something does happen when you're deep in the backcountry. Cool, cool. Got cambered skis. Don't bind them together. Laws of gravity. They work. If you can, keep them separate. Helps. Boots. Yeah, so for the ski boots, um, it's always a good idea. We'll start with number two, to put your boots away dry. So pull out the liners, dry them out. That's like kind of daily maintenance every time after you ski um, or ride. And then um, keep them buckled up when you storm from the summer, like not super overly tight, but tongues in line, um, buckled up in a good shape. Some people say there's like a plastic memory, but they just, you just want them to be all facing forward when you pull them out of storage. And for uh, snowboard boots, you can leave them, you know, laced up, same, same reasoning. As far as number one here, check your liners. What we're talking about is like are your liners of your boots um, worn out? Uh, so intuition liners, uh, the ones that you get heat molded to your feet uh, and all liners, they can pack out over time. So they start with your foot really snug and after a year or two, they might be a little bit packed out. So your foot is kind of swimming around in your boot. Um, and you might be thinking, shoot, I need to get new boots, but maybe all you need to do is get new liners. So if you like your boots, your boots fit well, you can keep your boots and maybe think about maybe getting some new liners, so a couple hundred bucks, get them heat molded. Uh, maybe they're like really sweaty and stinky. Mine kind of like a braid down from the hiking. So they just kind of wear down. So um, that's one way you can save a little bit of money is just getting new liners rather than getting all new boots. 
Um, that being said, if your boots are totally worn out, broken plastic, something that you can't repair, um, a lot of things you can repair. So call your company and you might be able to get new buckles, uh, new, uh, I don't know, screws, whatever you're missing. Um, but if you can't, you could replace them and end of season sales are pretty incredible in the spring. So it's a good time to replace while, while you're thinking of it, like Sarah said, like while it's still fresh in your mind, um, uh, at a little bit of a discount. So yeah, that's yeah. boots. Anything for boots? Questions? I know that a lot of hard booters um, sometimes have trouble with like pesky little hot spots. Well, maybe you can like hit up your local um, board shop or, or ski shop and just have them blow out your your hard boots while it's still fresh in your mind and you know exactly where that hot spot is because it's still red on the you know on the side of your foot. Um, just so that you're like ready for next season. And then yeah, like Emily said, like take advantage of some end of season sales and just support your local um, shops in your community, um, especially in this crazy time of the world. Definitely. I was going to say from a shop kid point of view, take advantage of this time where the ski shops are not super crowded and you could maybe sit down with your boot fitter one-to-one -one and actually hash out these problems, you know, instead of coming in right before Keystone opens or, you know, you know, and trying to get these problems solved. This is a good time where, you know, you can really, really, dial in these problems and take care of those. Cool, cool. Um, so we had someone ask a question, um, does it matter if we lay our boards, if we store them upright or vertical? And it looks like some people are already answering that. Well, yeah, I was just answering. <laughs> well, let's see if you think the same thing. I was, I was thinking yeah, it doesn't matter. Is. Camper is designed, <laughs> you know, for a body weight type of response. So I think if you store them vertically or horizontally, it shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking you could strap your skis together, just not right in the middle, you know, engaging the camber. If you just do it at the tip where there is no camber, that could be okay. Um, totally. Just don't like you know, bind them down in the roof of your car or whatever. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. They're, it's pretty durable equipment. Should be. Um, great questions. Um, uh, all right. So technical gear. So if we have any sort of mountaineers in the crowd right now who like to do um, steep vertical descents, uh, now's a good time to sharpen your crampons and your snow tools. Those are pieces of safety equipment so it's important that they're working and if you've had them for years and years and years and they're just starting to get pretty dull just take a file and start to sharpen them and i'm sure you can find plenty of tutorials online for that um, if you are into these more technical ascents and descents and you've got ropes and harnesses that you're using uh, just make sure that you're hanging those so that they're away from critters or at least placed in a place where um, little critters aren't going to get to them and then a lot of people don't think about the fact uh, their exposure uh, to corrosive substance substances um, and excessive heat uh, also sunlight can do a lot to nylon to uh, remove a lot of its strength. So um, anything, anywhere that, that a car goes, you don't really want your ropes or your harness, anything that's going to save your life, resting in any of those areas because cars leak motor oil and battery acid and things that could be corrosive to nylon. Um, and there is this thing that I actually just learned about because a friend posted this photo online of uh, some carabiners that he stored in a a uh, dry bag for uh, about a year and something happened called galvanic corrosion. So it does take some time for this to happen, but uh, make sure that you're not storing your metals, especially if there's different types of metals because it caused like a different like electrical reaction. Um, make sure you're not storing your metals in any sort of airtight containers. Um, yeah. Good tips, good tips. Mm -hmm. Right on skins, moving on to skins, skincare routine. I thought it was funny with that headline. So <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll uh, dive into that. Um, yeah, so skins um, on those super warm spring days. Uh, I mean, probably some people have experienced this when you get the clumping on the bottom of your skins when you're hiking up and you just slows you down, you don't glide, it feels heavy and terrible. Um, and so there's a couple things you can do to fix that. Um, 
you can put on a uh, skin wax. So it basically looks like a big crayon and you just rub it on and it helps keep the skins from getting moist, uh, thereby like picking up the snowballs under your feet. Um, Glob Stopper is a brand name of this skin wax and it's super helpful. Um, and then some people swear by getting like this, a silicone spray lube instead of the wax. Um, so I've heard from other guides that that's really helpful. And you can also use that silicone uh, spray in your binding, keep the snow from jamming up in there. I've heard it's great for, um, you know, pin bindings and also for split board bindings. So, um, yeah, so that's a good tip. You can also pick yourself up a scraper, um, you know, just plastic scraper, and you can scrape off the globs off the bottom of your skins and then put on the wax, and um, you should be in better shape for at least a couple runs. <laughs> um, so moving on to storage, uh, every time you put them away, put them away, like let them dry out kind of near the heater, but don't leave them overnight on top of the heater. And here in this photo, you can see how people are drying their skins folded up. And that is totally great and preferred way to dry your skins. If you unfold them to dry, you're just inviting dirt and dog fur and all kinds of stuff to like get stuck on there. So um, don't feel like you have to unfold them all the way. Drying them in half is great. Um, and when you store them over the winter, um, keep them somewhere cool and dry. And if you have those skin savers, like the plastic or the mesh that came with your skins when you bought them, I typically don't use those when I'm touring because it's just something that can get lost, blow away, another thing to fiddle with. But when I store over the winter, uh, sorry, over the summer, um, <laughs> I will put them in, uh, put those skin saver back on for summer storage. Um, so if you still have those that came with your stuff. Um, yeah, and it'll just, all this will do will is like good skincare just extends the life of your skins. So um, if you, you know, find that you're, it's getting really gloppy or something, uh, the glue will actually stick to your bases and you won't glide as nicely on the descent. Um, so if you find that happening and you don't have time to, order new skins or whatever. Um, some people swear by putting your skins in the freezer um, before your first application to your skis or board. So put them in the freezer overnight, get out to the trailhead, put on your skins while they're still cold. Um, that can really help. A better fix would be to re-glue re your skin. Um, and G3 has directions for this and a bunch of companies have directions for how to um, skin glue. Um, so Leanne Wren from the Underground in Breckenridge uh, Splitboard Shop, she loves to store her skis or skins in the freezer all summer. So I um, <laughs> want to give a shout out to answer that question. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then you can re-glue. I've never done it. Heard it's pretty toxic and gluey, but it looks easy on the video and I know people who have done it. I usually just buy new skins every couple of years. Have you guys, have you re-glued your skins? I've re glued my skins before and I made the mistake because I didn't have like a paint scraper to properly get all of the old glue off. And so it took me a lot longer than necessary. Um, if you do have a paint scraper, it can be a lot easier of a process. Um, I personally would, I never want to do it again. But like that's how terrible it was for me. But also I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing. So maybe people would have like a better time doing that. But I think the, the real big part is um, whether you're storing them in the freezer or not, I personally don't. Um, just make sure that you're not storing them in an overly hot environment um, and make sure that they're in a dry environment. I did, all, I did one time um, early on in my slowboarding career, store my skins in a really hot garage where it was just got up to like 90 degrees, <laughs> um, like every day in the summer and my skins were completely ruined by the end, of, uh, by the beginning of the next season. So be careful about what temperature you're storing them at. Yeah, dog hair is also a, the ultimate magnet. I don't know anything else that sticks more, but <laughs> keep away from your pets. For sure. All right, moving on. Beacon check, everyone. Take note, this beacon right here is outdated. We'll go into that next. Um, cool. So, um, 
checking checking your beacon for next sig for next season um you can check the signals this is something you should be doing every time you go skiing so turn your beacon on and when it flashes through all those lights and arrows and you know do, 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 it's actually doing a systems function uh check so what you want to see is that all the lights and arrows are lighting up in the right order every time and then it gives you the battery display usually so um, that's a little like run through check to make sure it's working and if your lights and arrows aren't going properly then it, it's it, that's the beacon telling you that the software has a glitch it's out of date it's not working right um, so that's something you can check every time you turn on your beacon um, but you can also check it now before you put it away um, so is your beacon more than five years old so these are delicate uh, electronics and um, they do get old and they do stop working well and the antenna can detune and they can get glitchy and funny so if it's more than five years old it's time to think about getting a new one and replacing it um, you also want to store these nicely every time like don't leave them in the car overnight take them in uh, don't drop them keep them dry um, can it, treat it more like a cell phone than like ski equipment like it should be carefully cared for. Um, so then the last slide we had a picture of the tracker DTS. So this is the tracker one. Um, yep, there it is. So this is a beacon that works and um, BCA stopped selling them. They're out of date. So you want to get a tracker two or three or uh, peeps or, or whatever, whatever kind of beacon you want. But this technology is getting old and it's not working as um, quickly, like if you sent that in to the manufacturer, that tracker DTS, they wouldn't uh, do like a systems update. They would probably recommend you get a new one. I don't know if they would give you a discount on a new, I don't, I don't know, you can check. Um, some vegan manufacturers do, they do the software updates um, and tune ups and stuff like that. Um, and sometimes they'll recommend you get a new one. Um, and then this is, this one really applies to everyone. Just take out the batteries from your battery compartment. Um, so often we we teach avalanche courses, and so often people are showing up with their beacon for the first time, and it's not working. And you open the battery compartment, and it's corroded. Um, so a really easy way to extend the life of your beacon: take out the batteries. Um, and you could put three brand new batteries um, in the container you're storing your beacon in for the summer. So when you pull it open, you're like, oh, look my. Your batteries are right there. Um, the partially used batteries I use for like my label maker and other non-essential uh, tools. Label maker. <laughs> yeah, big and we, we all need fresh mm -hmm. batteries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think the big thing is, is like, if you're not really sure um, about your beacon, just call the manufacturer and it's a good idea to kind of double check it every, uh, summer just to make sure that the manufacturer isn't recommending a software update and if that's the case now's the time to send it in for that software update awesome awesome moving on to some outerwear maintenance goggles sunglasses jacket pants goggles and sunglasses make sure they're not scratched you can always replace these at your local ski shop or you can replace your lenses Goggle covers, goggle sock, shout out. They're worth it. They will keep your goggles. Don't just throw them in your car like I do in the backseat. <laughs> keep them covered. Um, yeah, I love to uh, wash my sunglasses with dish soap um, to get rid of that greasy layer. And this, this photo of the Dawn, that is actually my favorite brand to use for this. <laughs> but anything will work except for like hate to say it the natural dish soap like it doesn't work for the sunglasses so I always have the natural dish soap so when I'm at my sister's house I always wash all my sunglasses with her hardcore dawn <laughs> <laughs> don't mess around don't mess around with the lenses <laughs> Um, and you can also replace the lenses in your sunglasses rather than replacing the whole thing. Uh, keep some stuff out of the landfill and get a nice fresh, I mean it is, I, I do consider sunglasses and goggles safety equipment because you need to be able to see where you're going. So clear 
lenses is a, is a treat and it's uh, essential. 100%. Mm -hmm. Jacket pants. I wonder, I want to make sure everyone can see cute Alex over here in the onesie. <laughs> <laughs> But making sure that your waterproof layers are still waterproof is probably a good time to do it at this time of year. Yeah, so yeah, you can use Nick Wax or Granger's. Um, I've never used Granger's, I've always just used Nick Wax. But yeah, you start with a tech wash and then you throw it in with the re-waterproofing wash that they sell after that. And yeah, like Ellen said, now's a Great time to do that. Make sure that all of your equipment's in tip top shape. Um, and another great thing to do right now is to, yeah, keep more things out of the landfill and make any repairs that you need to. If you know how to sew, sew up those holes. If you need to replace any zippers, I personally have no idea how to do that. So I'm gonna call up some manufacturers and just see if they'd be willing to repair a zipper for me. Um, or, you know, who knows, maybe they'd be willing to like offer me a discount on another pair um, or something like that. Oh, uh, Patagonia has a worn wear program and I actually just checked it out. They aren't doing any repairs right now because of the crazy world right now, but they do have some cool tutorials about how to sew um, to kind of get you repairing your own gear. And they also sell some peel and stick gear patches. And for puffies, I know Nick Wax for sure also sells a puffy wash that you can use. And you can also get something called tenacious tape if you need to patch any of your puffy holes or anything before you throw it in the washing machine and lose all of your feathers everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I have personally never taken my outerwear to a dry cleaner. Has anyone done that? Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't take it to any dry cleaner. It needs to be like a tech, like a specialized, like we do Gore-Tex. Um, so I did it this year. I've done it in the past. And um, just because uh, like the tech wash is like 10 to $20 a bottle. And they said they'd do my kit for 40 bucks. And so I was like, oh. And it came out great. It came out so, so fresh that my friends thought that I bought a new kit because usually by this time of the season, I have like, it just gets dirty. <laughs> so just like, I don't even know, just like, I don't know how there's food, that, like, ah, it's gross. So um, yeah, it came back, it is new. And um, yeah, so I'd recommend it, but I, I wouldn't take it to a regular dry cleaner because they might not be aware of the like specific needs of the Gore-Tex fabric, but um, there's like technical equipment cleaners usually in ski towns. So kind of a cool thing. Very yeah. cool. That's a, yeah, that's a pro tip right there. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here, folks. <laughs> um, all right. First aid. Definitely an important thing to check this time yeah. of year. Yeah, so usually in the spring, especially, um, it gets the weather gets hot, and so um, when you're hiking, your feet might be sweating, and you might have already used up all your blister stuff. So um, you can get moleskin, and I'm a big fan of these um, Band-Aid brand Hydro Seal Band-Aids that look like a blister, and you just throw it on top of your blister, and it absorbs the um, the pressure from your boot and and if you're on a multi-day trip or whatever they stay on for a couple days so they're great for hiking like in the summer too but um i usually get a bunch of those for myself and my clients and i think they're just like the best thing since sliced bread so usually by this time of the year i'm running out and buy a bunch more um also like maybe in your kit you have your emergency snack bars i like to pack snack bars for emergencies that I don't really enjoy because uh, if I pack like Snickers or something, I'll probably eat it in a non-emergency. But if I have like food I don't really like um, that's durable and has a shelf life, so I'll have a bunch of those in my pack. And maybe by this time of year, I've had a couple longer days than expected and maybe I've run out, so I'll restack. Restock those in the backpack, um, throw some extra, Batteries for my headlamp and for the beacon. I usually keep um, a set of three AAA batteries in my first aid kit in case I or like someone I'm touring with forgets their batteries. So 
I'll keep those in the first aid kit and maybe now I'll replace them. I tend to not put my used, partially used beacon batteries in the headlamp because I like to have a bright headlamp. So like I said, label maker. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, yeah, you can label everything now at your house. Marvel of the story. <laughs> um, yeah, and if you keep any sort of meds in your first aid kit, go. now's a great time to go through and make sure none of them are expired, which happens to me way more, like way more often than I ever expect. Like, I feel like they're always expired. Um, but yeah, just kind of go through and think about like, okay, if an emergency were actually to happen in the backcountry, what kinds of things would I need in here and just make sure that those are in there. Um, and another thing on this um, note is my repair kit. So um, a lot of times I kind of hose myself at the beginning of the season because I'm like, oh yeah, like what do I even put in my repair kit? And like, it actually can take some time to put it all together. So I like to just make sure that it's all together in one sack and ready to go. Um, and on that note, when I'm storing all of my winter stuff, I like to store them all together, like in the same spot of the garage or whatever, just so that I don't have to completely yard sale when I want to go out on my next adventure. Um, and it's all in one bin. I usually always have like things that I use a lot and then things that are just like, I don't even know why I still own. Um, so like if I have to disperse them, then I'll do like a bin of things that like I'll use and I can just grab that and go. Um, and then if I can't find anything, then I'll go to the second bin. It's kind of how I organize it. I don't know, you guys organize it any differently? <laughs> no, that's good, good, good tips. <laughs> right on, I think uh, we can open it up a little bit here. We've got some time. Um, like yeah. I said, I can really see the so question. Just, so we've got the comment that, um, that a uh, beacon signal drift can happen. So over time, the signal can drift and the location may not be accurate. And that's true. And you can, if you're, uh, now would be a great time to practice in the backyard with another, another friend and their beacon. And um, you can see exactly if you do the bracketing, you can see if you're, uh, how accurate your signal is. Um, and cause sometimes you might, especially if it's a, say a meter deep, and you're actually getting your low reading, you know, uh, in a different spot than the actual low reading, that is something that can happen over time. Uh, it's called signal drift with older beacons. And so if you practice with your beacon, you would, you would observe signal drift. And we do see this happen in our avalanche courses. Um, you know, people will come with beacons and we'll be like, we'll be doing these drills and that's when we'll notice that signal drift has happened. So another good time to do drills because you'll pick up on those weird glitches um with your stuff and you can contact the manufacturer and they might be able to adjust that and we have another comment that says if you contact bca they used to offer a trade-in discount and so they may or may not have a program like that um going on right now so um ellen and emily i am trying to look for the facebook live uh to make sure that nobody asked any questions there but i'm having a hard time so yeah, I don't see the Facebook Live. Um, let's see, we've got a question from Ryan S. What's your go-to summer activity to stay fresh for the winter? Um, so to keep my knees strong, I'll do um, the the insanity workouts with the jumping, like the tuck jumps and the basketball style drills. And I think it <laughs> makes my skiing better, but it's really hard, so I'm not doing it yet. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys do? I mean, I don't think my necessary like goal is to make sure that I'm fresh for the winter, but I just like to go climb a bunch of mountains still, you know, and you can still do a lot of really awesome summer lines as long as you have the knowledge to do it safely, um, kind of all throughout the summer. So that's kind of one of the pieces too. Like if you are into summer mountaineering and summer descents, Colorado, a lot of lines in Colorado can hold a lot of snow. So I'm still either snowboarding or um, climbing. I like to climb 13ers because um, I feel like they're a lot more pristine than 14ers. Um, and I also just do a lot of guiding. So a lot of times I just don't even have time to think about how to stay fresh for winter. And I'm just like out rock climbing um, with a bunch of clients. 
That's kind of what I do. <laughs> Helen, do you have anything that you do? I am an avid rollerblader, <laughs> which I think would make me a better skier, but you know, it, it actually doesn't translate quite as well. I need to try it a little bit harder, um, but <laughs> that's, that's what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm always on the lookout for some new, new workouts. I'm also new to the splitboarding world, so I'm trying to, you know, find better ways to stay, stay in shape. That's always my main thing is going uphill. I'm like, dang, I need to be in better shape for this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. So like climbing mountains, there's just like never ending mountains in Colorado. So I'm basically still just climbing mountains. It's just that there's less snow now. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Luckily Boulder's got some good local, like local hiking spots around here too. So yeah, we're lucky. Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, so I'm not exactly sure if Facebook turned out, but if anything, we're going to be posting the recording on there so post your questions we'll be able to take care of all of those we're also going to be having a blog that we're sharing next week with all of this information a little bit more in depth um be sure to follow backcountry babes and weston on facebook and instagram um we're going to be doing more of these next season guys so slay at home we'll have speakers on how to's more educational series and whatnot. Sarah, Emily, you guys have any final words to say to the people? Um, I just uh, left a comment. Um, oh, it looks like it got sent privately. Let me know if you got it. I left a comment that says you can reach out to me anytime if you come up with any questions or if anyone wants to go rock climbing. Cause let's right. see. Um, mm-hmm. Did did you get my comment? Do you guys all see my email and my Instagram? I'll have this. I'll post your email, your contact information after this as well, too. So okay. Sarah, personally. Yeah. Well, Dirt well, love beauty. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not seeing it on there. Reach out anytime. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. It's nice to touch base. And yeah, we operate in the winter, so we are planning our 2021 trip calendar right now, starting December 2020 and going through January, February, March, April 2021 um, for avalanche courses and rescue courses and beginner splitboarding, beginner backcountry skiing, and our annual international trips too. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, you can check them out online. You can shoot me an email. Those pretty much go to me, Emily at Backcountry Babes, and info at Backcountry Babes comes comes to me too. So I'm happy to always happy to talk about skiing and ski trips. So um, yeah, we're looking forward to next winter season already um, as we get out there and enjoy our um, physically distant adventures but not socially isolating so (laughs) physically isolated not socially so it's nice to see everyone and ellen and sarah thanks so much for putting this on and getting us all out here Yeah. yeah thanks so much ellen you put a lot of good work in and thank you guys all for tuning in the weston community is always so great and welcoming we love you guys yes thank you guys emily sarah you guys are rock stars um, yeah, like you said, any questions, we're, we're here, we're friends, we're happy to help. Um, cool. Thanks. Happy Friday, everyone. <laughs> stay safe, stay healthy. Yes. Bless up. All right. See if I can end this gracefully. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs>